It was supposed to be a fun getaway. Summer is ending, and soon we would all be back in the classroom, and Tyler just couldn't let our freedom go without one last hurrah. Truth be told, I was a bit uninterested in the whole thing. We'd been going to parties, getaways, and of course our week-long vacation all summer. I'd intended to take the week off, but Austin, my boyfriend, was insistent on going. He'd always loved the outdoors. Not that I don't enjoy the woods, I really do, but I just wanted a nice movie night, maybe a bowl of ice cream and lots of sleep. But he's always been an absolute energizer bunny, bursting with energizer bunny, bursting with endless energy and nearly as much optimism. It was just going to be the four of us, Tyler, his girlfriend Charity, Austin, and I. While it took some nagging on his part, I eventually relented on the promise that we would stay in next week and do something more low kind. I still remember the smile on his face. He kissed me on the forehead and insisted I was going to love it. As if I hadn't been camping before, huh? They'd chosen a park out in the Appalachians to camp at. I'd never heard of it before, and so I immediately did a quick Google search to get an idea what I was getting myself into. I'm not one for surprises. I like to know what I'm walking into. The pictures made it seem nice enough. There was even a lake we'd be able to go swimming at, and I was always down for a good time in the water. Of course, Tyler was going to pester me about fishing, because pulling slimy, wet animals out of the water is so fun. I decided then and there to make Austin fish in my stead, so I could enjoy myself as I wanted. It took maybe two hours to get out to the campsite, a relatively flat hilltop surrounded by thick foliage and bushes. The boys had the foresight to pick a location with a little gazebo and a pair of grills that looked like they'd been there since the beginning of time. Seriously, why are they always so rusty and antiquated? I remember overhearing Charity talking with Tyler as they set up their tent. We're not going to be able to see anything once the sun goes down. I could hear the trepidation in her voice. She'd always been scared of the dark. Babe, it'll be fine. He gestured toward the fire pit in the center of the campsite. We can light a fire, and I brought enough lanterns and flashlights to turn this place into the Vegas Strip. Let's hope so. That place is amazing. Tyler chuckled, planting a tent. Stake into the ground. I've always had good luck in Vegas. I bet I'm going to get lucky here, too, she smirked. Lucky? Hey, we'll see. I nudge Austin gently, who was busy trying to decipher the crappy picture instructions on the side of the tent bag, babe. Let's make sure there's some space between our tent and theirs. He turned to look at me with his infuriating yet endearing yet endearing grin. Why? I was going to put us right next door. <sighs> what if I want to be able to get a good night's sleep for once? I don't see any train tracks for some damn train to come down at four in the morning, and I want to take advantage of that. But we can't let them get lonely. I punched him in the shoulder. Shut up. I'm sure they'll be fine on their own. He laughed. I still remember the sound. It's one of my favorite sounds in the whole world. I wish I could go back to that moment and change things, but I was oblivious to what was going to go down. It was several hours later when I was sitting by the fire, leaning in Austin's embrace and watching the flames dance brilliantly. The moon was mostly obscured by the clouds, so we were surrounded by a thick blanket of darkness. Tyler had killed and cooked up one of the bass he caught. Or maybe it was trout. I can't tell the difference. He'd offered to make dinner for all of us, but I declined, eating something caught fresh out of the lake. A lake, we know. Next to nothing about. Just wasn't my thing. I ate what I packed instead. Austin had taken him up on the offer, and was finishing up the piece he'd been served as dinner. You know, this ain't half bad, bro. Maybe you're onto something with your whole Bear Grills routine. <laughs> You're starting to come around then, huh? He raised his hand to stop him. No, I just said the food was good. I'm not trying to learn how to forage and crap to survive in the woods. Tyler took another bite, speaking with the unnecessarily full mouth. Hey, you never know when this stuff might come in handy. It could save... I rolled my eyes in exasperation and drowned their conversation out. He could go on for hours with survival tips and how to eat freaking rattlesnakes to survive... I found myself studying the forest instead, at least what little I could see of it. A gentle wind blew through the trees, its soft whisper floating through the air to create an almost peaceful atmosphere. And yet something seemed off, 
I listened closely. I couldn't put my finger on it, but something just seemed odd. The forest was dead silent. No crickets chirping, no frogs croaking, nothing. Nothing other than the wind, of course. A bush rustled on the edge of the clearing, maybe fifty feet away, for just a moment. I could have sworn I saw a shadow. Maybe a small figure moved deeper inside the bush, suddenly feeling a little cold inside. I narrowed my eyes and checked again for whatever it was I saw. Nothing. I chalked it up to my imagination. Meanwhile, over the sound of the crackling fire, Tyler was in the middle of some sort of animated discussion. Wouldn't believe it, man. But it seems like every place like this has spooky legends from 500 years ago surrounding it. Austin sounded intrigued. What kind of legends? Can we not? Charity huffed. You guys know I don't like the dark. I want to be able to sleep with both eyes closed tonight. Tyler smirked at her. We were planning on sleeping. He earned a quiet shut-up and a smack on the leg from her. I sighed at the amusement he got from tormenting her. We watched the fire in silence for a moment. Before I stood up, I don't know about you three, but a moonlight swim sounds amazing right now. You're all welcome to come with, Charity declined quickly, moving closer to her boyfriend and grabbing his hand. He just shrugged apologetically. Austin stood up dutifully. I'll come with you. Babe, I recognize that tone. I put a reassuring hand on his arm. The lake is basically right down the hill. If you don't want to come, you don't have to. I'll be fine. Are you sure? I nodded. He sure. I nodded. He shrugged and sat down. I'll probably be down a little later then. Damn. He looked handsome in the light of the fire. I leaned down and gave him a kiss, then started off toward the lake. It really wasn't that far away, like maybe sixty or seventy yards. I clicked my flashlight on and began pushing through the forest undergrowth. Why wasn't there already a path? Almost immediately, I started getting a strange feeling. A feeling I was being watched. I glanced around nervously, shining my light into the dark woods on either side, but I didn't see anything. No eye, shine, no movement. Despite the lingering feeling, I continued onward. I quickly took my shorts and shirt off on the shore and waded in, leaving the flashlight shut off alongside my clothes. The water was warm at the top and chillier the deeper it got. I took in a deep breath, enjoying the fresh smell of nature, and swam out into the water. Rolling over onto my back, I huffed in disappointment at the night sky. I had been hoping to enjoy the stars, as we couldn't exactly see any inside the city, but I forgot about the clouds. At least I have the moon to keep me company, I thought to myself. I don't know how long I was in the water, maybe fifteen minutes, but my mind quickly started wondering. I was glad I came, even if sleeping in a tent sucked. It had been a while since I'd had a chance to get unplugged from technology and back out to nature. Out there it was just us and the woods, the thought gave me pause. I opened my eyes and raised my head, glancing back out at the tree line. Everything seemed normal, except for the quiet. The forest wasn't just quiet, it was silent. The more I thought about it, the more it didn't sit well with me. Curious, I swam back to the shore, grabbing the flashlight. I turned it on and shined it out into the wilderness. Once again, no eye shine. Usually, if you shine a light into the woods, the eyes of insects, spiders, and... Other animals shone back like little fireflies of varying color. I couldn't think of a single time I'd not seen eye shine in the woods. At least, not none at all. That feeling started to come back again, more intensely. I stepped on a stick, and it freaking hurt, so I went back and put my shoes on. Then I started searching. The bushes, logs, the branches for bugs, or anything else. I probably spent a good couple minutes doing so. Nothing. That feeling from before was growing stronger, like something was watching me somewhere in the shadows, and it was getting closer. I tried to ignore it. It was just my head playing tricks on me. But it was like the air around me was constricting on my neck. Then I could swear I saw something. A dark shadow ducking beneath a downed tree in the distance. My stomach tightened as fear began to seep in. I had to have been seeing things but I felt the urge to scream for Austin or Tyler to come down here. I quickly took a couple deep breaths to calm down and started hiking toward the campsite. I thought about going back for my clothes and phone, but that feeling was growing stronger. 
and I was trying hard not to freak out about nothing. I could swear the darkness was getting thicker, more oppressive by the moment. I began speed walking, then nearly running until I broke through the tree line. I was vaguely aware of a cut on my shin bleeding mildly, but I ignored it and marched right up to the group. They were still huddled around the campfire. Austin, guys, I have a weird feeling right now. The others glanced at me silently. What do you mean, Allie? I took a deep breath. I felt a bit safer being out of the woods and around the guys, but I couldn't shake that evil feeling in the pit of my being. Austin, I think I may have seen something out there. That got his attention. He stood up quickly, saw something. What do you mean? Suddenly I felt really dumb. I probably looked like a schoolgirl again, breaking eye contact and grabbing my arm nervously. I... I don't, I don't know. I saw like a shadow or something. So like a fox or something. Tyler a fox or something. Tyler a fur... I shook my head. No, not like that. It was like dark. It was hard to describe. Charity spoke up, her voice laced with concern. That sounds an awful lot like that legend you were telling us about Ty. I glanced at him expectantly. Before I could open my mouth, he stood up and shook his head, putting his hands up. Look, you likely saw some sort of small animal, like a possum or something. It's no big deal. There's lots of wildlife around here. We don't need to worry about some stupid ghost story. He put a reassuring hand on Charity's shoulder and squeezed it. Besides, as long as we stay by the fire, we'll be okay, right? What he was saying made sense. I knew that. But I couldn't shake the feeling building in my gut. Something dangerous was out there. At least, that's what my imagination was saying. Look, I took another step toward the fire. I know it's probably no big deal, but could you two, you know, take a quick look? Just so I can have some peace of mind. The guys exchanged a silent look, the fire still crackling in the background. Sure, why not? Austin grabbed a flashlight. If there's something out there, we'll find it. Tyler sighed reluctantly. Fine, we'll check it out. I'm sure everything's just fine, but there's strength in numbers, I guess. While the guys marched down the hill, I sat down beside Charity. She was clutching her flashlight tightly, as if it was her ticket to safety. I knew we should have went downtown instead. I chuckle. Hey now, you'd probably be wiping vomit off Tyler's shirt in a few hours. You know how he is about over-drinking. This isn't all bad. She nodded before glancing me up and down. Did you forget your clothes? Suddenly, a chill went down my spine. My instincts were screaming at me. I was being watched. Or maybe my imagination. If it was my imagination, it was starting to work in overdrive. And it was doing a really good job. Still, I didn't want to make a big deal out of nothing. So I shrug instead. I, well, this is going to sound pretty silly, but I felt really nervous. I swallowed quickly. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. Charity's eyes widened like, like you were being watched. My stomach sank. For a moment, at least. Then I shook my head and tried to think rationally. Look, girl, I think we're all feeling pretty hyped up right now, but it's just our imagination. We're rubbing off on each other. I'm sure everything's fine. If there's anything down there to be worried about, the boys will find it. She laughed nervously, turning back to the fire. Yeah, yeah, that's probably it. We'll be safe with the guys, I'm sure. I nodded reassuringly and put a hand on her shoulder. Then I looked up. A shadow in the tree line. It quickly ducked away. My blood ran cold. I rubbed my eyes, glancing back in the same spot. I couldn't see anything, but the feeling of peril was getting stronger. Just then, the guys came back. They were moving quickly, which didn't do anything to calm my nerves. Tyler took a deep breath and shook his head slightly, as if in disbelief. Well, girls, we didn't find anything. That said, do you two kinda have a bad feeling about all this? Yes, we replied together. While I moved over to Austin on the other log, Tyler took a seat beside his girl. Well, ladies, I'm not one to get caught up in superstitious nonsense, but Austin and I have the same feeling. So we're all gonna stay up by the fire where it's safe and wait it out, okay? I thought of the shadows I kept see, thinking I was seeing. I could picture them clearly. There was something wrong about them, maybe. Maybe we should cut our losses and head home. Charity nodded vigorously in agreement. Austin wrapped his arm around me. Look, I know it feels a little freaky, but I'm sure everything's all right. It's just the woods. We'll stay together. 
try to enjoy the night, and it's all gonna be okay. Sound good? I leaned in the crook of his arm and placed my head on his shoulder. I nodded slightly. Somehow, despite the looming feeling of danger, I felt better when I was in his arms. Like everything was going to be fine. And I really did believe it would be okay. Rationally, everything was fine. I just couldn't forget the shadows. The s'more was delicious, and yet I didn't feel any better. I was just feeling worse and worse and worse as time passed. I could see it in the others' faces, too. Tyler had suggested we make the campfire treats to get our minds off of the boogeyman, and yet I felt worse, and I could see they were feeling the same. Even Tyler was quiet, shifting his weight around aimlessly rather than being his usual jovial self. I'd been trying to get up the courage to go get my stuff from the lake, but the longer I waited, the less appealing the woods became. Eventually... I relented mentally. I didn't want to be a chicken, but the fear won out over my self-consciousness, guys. Could one of you go get my stuff? I left my clothes and my phone down by the water. I was still in my soggy bikini at this point. I really just wanted to get my clothes back. After a moment, Tyler swallowed and stood up. Sure, I'll get it. But first, he hurried over to his tent and unzipped it. I'm going to break out the big guns. He emerged a moment later with a lantern, a flashlight, and a knife. He hooked the blade and the flashlight to his belt and lit the lantern. It was surprisingly bright. Now I'll be ready for anything that goes bump in the night. He did a little shimmy dance, but I couldn't bring myself to smile. All I could muster was a quiet thanks. He nodded solemnly and hurried off toward the lake. I snuggled up closer to my boyfriend, Austin. Call me crazy, but something just doesn't feel right. We should leave. He gave me a squeeze. Don't worry about it, Allie. Everything's fine. We'll forget about it by morning. His words were comforting, but I could tell from his tone. He really wasn't sure if he believed that himself. I glance up at the moon again. Stupid camping trip. I couldn't even see the stars. I was honestly feeling pretty salty about the whole ordeal. Camping wasn't even that bad. I enjoyed it under the right circumstances. But the night just had a bad vibe, and it was ruining everything. The fire crackled gently. The logs were beginning to turn to ashes, so Austin got up and put a fresh log on it. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced the night and straight through my soul. I'll never forget the sound of pure terror. Austin leapt frantically to his feet, Tyler. He sprinted off down the hill where the sound came from, heart pounding. I grabbed my flashlight and ran after him, ignoring Charity's pleas to stay with her. He got a ten-yard head start, but that increased quickly until he hit the wood line. I was able to catch up a bit as the uneven ground slowed him down. Snapping my light on, I hurried after him, that terrifying feeling of evil right on the edge of my senses. Ty! Tyler! He shouted his name repeatedly, his words laced with a panic I'd never heard from him. The woods gave no response other than the crunching of twigs and sticks beneath our feet. We spread out a bit, searching frantically for our friend. I wasn't having any luck finding him, even though he took the same route I did. I kept searching until, eventually, I noticed a shadow duck behind a tree. My blood ran cold, Austin. He didn't seem to hear me. I was petrified. I tried to move my legs, but they wouldn't work. My light was fixed squarely on that tree, but nothing emerged from behind it. But I could feel something was there. I called out Austin's name again. This time, he hurried over. What? Are you okay? I struggled to get my words out. I, I think I saw a shadow behind that tree. He glanced at the tree, then squeezed my shoulder. It's gonna be all right, babe. Your mind is your worst enemy right now. Don't let it play tricks on you. I took a deep breath and I felt a surge of adrenaline course through my body. I then became acutely aware of Charity's frantic shouting, trying to get our attention. She sounded terrified, and who could blame her? He spun me around to look in my eyes. Look, you go check on Charity and tell her to calm down, then come back down here and help me find Tyler. I took a deep breath and nodded, then I ran toward the campfire. I cursed myself quickly for not wearing pants to protect my legs from shrubbery, up at the campsite, Charity was huddled close by the fire, watching for us. I heard her call my name when she saw me, and she rushed forward to meet me. I found myself caught in her death grip. Oh my God, Allie, what was that? Is Tyler all right? I quickly worked to separate myself from her. Look, 
Austin is down there looking for him right now. He sent me up to tell you everything is fine. I took her by the shoulders and made her face me. We're gonna find him, okay? Now I'll be right back. I rushed back toward the woods, ignoring her cries for company. I felt bad about it, but Tyler needed me more. Maybe it was the adrenaline, but in spite of the dark, impending feeling, I felt brave. Austin saw me approaching and called me over. By the time I reached him, I was panting pretty heavily and thanking pretty heavily and thanking myself for not completely giving up on running after high school. I was still able to get the words out, did you? Fine. Toward the forest floor... Tyler's lantern, now cracked, lay on the ground. A few feet away, I saw his flashlight and his knife. My clothes and, and phone were nearby as well, but he wasn't there. But most bizarre, a small cloud was floating a few feet off the ground. The best I could describe it is like mist, but dark, very dark. I shined my light on it, but it didn't move. What the? I knelt down beside the... I knelt down beside the... thing... Just looking at it made goosebumps rise on my body. Maybe it was crazy, but there was something sinister about the thing. <laughs> my head whipped around toward the sound. Austin was already glancing in that direction. It almost looked like he was trembling. Ah, oh, Allie, what? He took a deep breath, speaking slowly and softly. What was it you said about seeing shadows? My eyes widened. Before I could say anything... We heard Charity screaming up by the campfire. Austin cursed, sprinting toward the campsite. I followed him as fast as I could. As I ran, I had a view of the fire from the tree line. It was hard to see, but it looked like Charity was freaking wrestling something, like an arm of darkness had wrapped around her and was pulling her back. Her screaming pushed me to run faster. She fell backward and behind the log. The screams stopped. Charity! I was freaking out beyond belief at this point. What the hell was happening? It was like that evil feeling was manifesting in physical form and attacking them. Austin reached the campfire first and stopped. I got up there a few moments after. My heart dropped when I saw it. A cloud of darkness hovering just above the ground like mist. Her flashlight sat abandoned beside the campfire. At that point, I really lost my senses to fear. I don't remember everything, but I know I was looking around frantically, flashing my light around the woods in terror. I saw a shadow, two, three, off by the tree line. Ally? Austin grabbed hold of me. I, I don't know how long he'd been trying to get my attention, babe. I don't know what's going on here, but we need to go. Follow me to the car. Let me go first, and we'll go get the police. Okay. I was on the verge of hyperventilating, but I nodded. So long as I had Austin, I could do this. We both started hurrying along the path to the car. It was a ways off, maybe 200 meters. I couldn't help but start glancing around with my light shadows. They were small, ranging in size from maybe the size of a possum to a child. They were quick, darting between hiding spots or simply freaking disappearing. Babe, eyes on me, I quickly turned back to him. I quickly turned back to him. I quickly turned back to him. I say run, run, okay? Not that we weren't already hurrying. We were already jogging, but he was trying to keep me calm. He knew I wasn't as fast as he was. I heard rustling all around us, branches shaking, sticks breaking. I sped up, barely holding onto my composure. A shadow emerged on the edge of the light. I screamed his name in warning. I watched with my own eyes, and this thing pulled, latched onto his arm. Austin screamed, and I ran to grab him as he started to stumble forward. A pitch-black hole opened in the air. This creature, it pulled him into the hole. His cries of fear vanished as the hole collapsed, replaced by a black mist. This time I screamed. I ran like a wild animal into the woods. It probably wasn't the best idea, but all I could think of was getting away from what I'd just witnessed. I could hear something behind me. Bushes rustling, twigs snapping. It was right behind me. I ran faster than I ever have in my life. I don't know how many cuts and scrapes I got, but I kept going. It was an eternity. I hit a rock and pitched forward, smacking into the ground. 
My flashlight skidded away from me and sharp stones cut into my arms, hands, and knees. I scrambled to grab it, but one of the damned shadow creatures pounced between me and it. I kept running, despite the burning in my lungs as hard as I could. I don't know how long it was, a few seconds or a few minutes later, but suddenly everything went black. The first thing I felt was soreness. My entire body ached. I groaned, cracking an eye open. There was light, light from somewhere, maybe a window. Where am I? I felt like I was waking up from a bad dream. Then it all came rushing back. I sat up and screamed. A moment later, there was someone beside me, comforting me. I started to regain my senses. I was in a room, maybe a cabin of some sort, lying on a bed. There was a man in a park ranger uniform holding my hand. He rubbed my shoulder soothingly. Miss, you're fine. Just breathe. It's going to be fine. I started hyperventilating. I started hyperventilating. The room began to spin, and I half fell, half leaned my head into his shoulder. He seemed a bit unsure, but gave me an embrace. We were like that for a good few minutes. Slowly, I calmed down and started focusing on what was around me. I seemed to be in a cabin of some sort, maybe a ranger station. I had some sort of jacket, but other than that I was still in my swimsuit from the previous night, my body hurt. The soreness was intense, and numerous cuts stung as a reminder of the previous night. Most of them had been dressed and bandaged. I honestly looked like hell. Miss... Are you feeling okay? We found you passed out in the woods not far from here. I just stared at him blankly. All the emotion, it was like it was being replaced with a rushing wave of numbness. Like I wasn't even there. He squeezed my shoulder gently. What's your name? Again, it felt like an out-of-body experience. Like I wasn't the one speaking with my own voice. Allison. All right, Miss Allison. You're safe here. Can you explain to me what's going on? He paused for a moment. Take your time. No rush. So I did. It was a slow process, especially because I was already struggling to remember the previous night. It would come back in rushing, terrifying pieces. After what must have been half an hour, his expression was profoundly discouraged. I'm glad you're okay, Allison. You might find it hard to believe, but I know you're telling the truth. I stared at him blankly, tears in my eyes, but confused. He, you do. What do you mean? He sighed. He brushed a piece of bark out of my blonde hair. It was comforting in a way, even though he was old enough to be my father. He took his ranger hat off, solemnly. It's not supposed to be public knowledge, but we are vaguely aware of the shadows you ran into. It's the reason President Wilson made this place a park a hundred years ago. Besides the beauty, to safeguard the public and figure out what exactly goes on out. Here, here. He sighed heavily, these occurrences... They're incredibly rare, and as far as I was aware, we'd pretty much gotten rid of them. But they've supposedly been around since Native American times. We don't know what they are, frankly. Some say they're from another dimension, others say it's supernatural. We just don't know. I nodded slowly, taking it all in. Honestly, I was heartbroken, and all the emotions of the last 18 hours were overwhelming, so I said nothing. The ranger continued, There are a few things we know about them. They only come out at night, and when there are few stars. And they're attracted to light. I was confused. Light, yes. Light attracts them. They hate light, and they'll take anyone around it. When I fell into the pit, it seemed forever before I hit the bottom. The earth there was muddy and soft on the surface, but an inch down the hard clay wasn't so forgiving. I'd pitched forward as I'd fallen, making my right knee the first thing to hit and flare with pain. I rolled over onto my back and clutched it instinctively, even as I realized that my left wrist and shoulder were aching and my right wrist was worse. Brained, at least, and maybe broken. My breath had been knocked from me, only coming back in short, painful gasps as I looked around. I was down in a hole. No, not just a hole. It was a pit, an intentionally dug pit, that had something laid over it. I remembered my foot hitting it as I ran, giving way before I could take the step back. Eyes watering, I looked up at the circle of daylight above me, a small patch of blue sky almost completely obscured by a canopy of green. The forest was dense here. 
That was what I'd loved about it since I started hiking the area last fall. That feeling of natural beauty and solitude that was more serene than lonely, making me feel more a part of something than apart from everything. But then, I'd heard something, hadn't I? Something walking in the woods nearby, still out of sight, but growing closer. My first thought had been a deer, but the longer it went on, it didn't sound right. I'd been with my father hunting enough growing up to know the soft, tentative rustling noises deer tend to make unless running scared, and I'd heard no gunshots in the hour I'd been out there. This sound was louder, less graceful and more constant, as though something was noisily barreling through the trees and brush, maybe at quite a distance. I had the panicked thought of a bear, but pushed it from my mind. Possible, sure, but really unlikely. Who knew? Maybe it was a running deer, or one of a dozen other animals that could make tons of noise in an empty forest when they had a mind to. Or maybe... I wasn't the only hiker out there. I'd never been sure who even owned the property, just that it was part of a thousand-acre tract of woodland that backed up to a nearby state park. In the six months I'd been coming out, I'd never seen a sign of hunters, hikers, or anything else, but that didn't make it. I caught a glimpse of moving shadow off to my right. What was that? Was it a person? Slowing down, I watched the area where I thought I'd seen motion. A moment later, the figure passed from behind a tree, and I stifled a scream. It was a person, but not a hiker or hunter. They were wearing a long poncho or cloak, hooded and black and trailing behind them as they picked up speed again. That was strange enough. There hadn't been any rain all day, and it was unseasonably warm. But then I saw their face, or where their face would have been. It was hard to say at a distance while they ran, but I thought they were wearing a dark mask. Maybe a gas mask, heart pounding. I crouched down where I was. They were running closer, but at an off angle that would probably see them intersect my trail half a mile back. It could be that they hadn't seen me at all, and whoever it was, whatever they were doing, I was keen to keep it that way. Watching from between the branches of a bush, I caught glimpses of the figure as it ran forward with a lurching, wavering pace made all the more unnerving by the unbroken dark silhouette of the coverings it wore. I couldn't even make out arms, and only the barest hint of legs between the length of the poncho and the obstacles between us, just a billowing black shape plunging through the woods like a specter chasing some unseen prey, unless that unseen prey was me. I was assuming it hadn't seen me, but how did I know that? Did I really want to wait for it to get closer in the hopes it would pass on by, or was I better off easing on down the path while it was far enough away to likely miss any subtle movement at a distance? Stomach in knots, I chose the latter, easing forward in a crouch. Up ahead, maybe a hundred yards or more, there was a thick knot of fir trees. If I could get past them, put their bulk between us, I'd have a better chance of moving forward without them ever seeing me. I moved another few feet, and then paused to check the position of the specter. Was it still flailing along on the same trajectory, or had it chosen another path? Oh God, it had stopped, and it was looking right at me. Suddenly, it started running again, its jerking gait faster and more desperate as it came directly toward me. I thought I could almost hear excited groans from behind the mask, and I heard myself let out a moan as I stood up and began to run. I'm in good shape. But I'd already been hiking for two hours, and this was a part of the forest I'd never been in before. My need for speed had to be balanced with care that I didn't trip on a root or lose my sense of direction. Glancing back again, I saw that the dark figure had made it to my path and was gaining on me. Giving a panicked grunt, I pushed myself harder to widen the gap between us. When I hit the stand of furs, I veered to the right, hoping the change in direction would throw it off. The woods were denser and darker in that direction, and it would only take a few yards for me to be hard to spot at a distance. When I looked back, I saw no sign of the other, but that meant little on its own as the trees obscured my vision too. I needed to rely on sound more now, while making less noise myself. It was hard to make myself slow down, but I eased to a brisk trot, and then a softer, more gentle walk. The way forward was shadowy, except for occasional patches of sunlight. 
but I thought I still had a rough idea of which way I was headed. For now, my main concern was any signs of being pursued, glimpses of flailing darkness or the crashing thud of the specter running close behind. I did hear some noises, but at first they didn't seem to be getting closer, and as I moved on, I could tell they were growing more faint. Turning back to look again, I saw no sign of movement behind me. Good. I was probably four miles from the edge of the state park, and another two from my car. If I picked up my pace, I could get there in an hour. My steps crunched louder as I began to jog forward, but I took care to be as quiet as possible, and the extra speed seemed worth the slight increase in noise. Probably five minutes passed before I heard a loud crack from somewhere behind me. Likely just a branch falling, but I still picked up my pace, my pulse quickening for more than the exertion. That was when my foot hit ground. That wasn't ground, that wasn't ground, and I found myself tumbling through the dark. Reaching a wall of the pit, I dug my fingers into the dirt there as I tried to stand. I could manage, but putting any weight on my right leg sent a shock of pain up my spine that took my breath away. Not that it mattered. The walls were made of that same hard clay and ran up fifteen feet all around, and I pictured the pit as being an oval from above. Glancing around, my gaze caught on something near where I'd landed. A brown tarp lay nearby amid a clutter of branches and leaves. That had been what had covered the hole. This wasn't just a random pit. It was a trap. Who would do this, and why? Was it intended for something in particular? It had to be, right? Otherwise, what was the point of digging a trap out in the middle of nowhere? What were the odds a random person would fall into it? Maybe it wasn't even for people, though. People dug pits to trap animals, didn't they? Even big things that could climb, like tigers. But there were no tigers out here. Coyotes and deer, maybe a bear or a bobcat. Just normal wood critters in me, and a shadow fell over me as I looked up with a gasp. The hooded specter stood at the edge of the pit, looking down at me. It was a gas mask, after all, and behind it I could hear frenzied squeals. It shuffled excitedly for a moment and then hurled itself forward into the pit, landing on its side with a thump just a few feet away. I was screaming then, but as I watched the thing writhe and squirm in the mud, I felt a growing sense of confusion as well. Why would it just throw itself down here with me? The fall had looked like it hurt, and I still saw no signs of its arms from underneath the muddy black poncho it was wearing. As it was, it was just crawling its way to the far wall, where it slowly sat itself up with a labored grunt. Still, I couldn't trust anything here. Wincing at my wrist, I dug into my pocket for my phone as I kept my eyes on the lump of shadow against the far wall. Glancing down, I felt my stomach lurch. The screen was broken, and punching the power button did nothing at all. I looked back over at the specter. It wasn't moving. It just sat watching me and... Was it crying, heart in my throat? I edged forward. Hello? What is this? What the F is going on? Just more sobbing, the hood swaying gently as it shook its head. I was terrified of touching it, but I was out of other options. Maybe they were hurt enough to not fight me, and if they had a phone or something... I could at least try to call for help. I held my dead phone in my throbbing right hand as I reached out to pull up the mask. It was a girl, a crying girl of maybe twenty, eyes red and wild as she looked at me pleadingly, her nostrils flaring as she sucked in panicked breaths. She had no other options either. Her mouth had been glued shut. I sucked in a breath. Mm. What? What the fuck? I noticed a seam down the front of the poncho secured by clasp buttons down to the waist. Hand shaking, I tugged at the buttons until the top pew came free. The girl's arms had been tied behind her under the poncho, and judging from the odd angle of the left one, it seemed badly broken either from the fall or something before. A large dog collar, one of those shock collars with electrodes with electrodes, was tight against her neck and taped across her chest was a green note written in black ink. There is only one parachute. Behind me, I heard the sound of an approaching motor and felt a thrill of hope as I looked up toward the opening. Maybe it was a park ranger, or even a hunter that had heard us. Either way, I wasn't going to risk them riding by without stopping, so I started to scream and yell at the top of my lungs as I stared into the light. 
The engine noise grew closer and closer as my voice began to grow hoarse, and I had a moment of relief as I heard the engine shut off just above the pit. How? We're trapped down here. Please help us. There was no response, and I was about to yell again when I saw a large white hose creep over the edge of the hole. Maybe they were going to use the hose as a rope to get us out. But then the hose stopped, and a clear liquid began trickling and then pouring from it, splashing the ground as it came on faster and faster. The smell from it was in my nostrils almost immediately, and as a pool began to form and it splashed further and further, a drop hit my shoe and began to sizzle. Oh, God, it was acid! Someone was pouring acid down here! My shoe was still hissing as another drop hit my pants leg, eating through my jeans to touch liquid fire to my calf. Screaming, I pulled my pants leg up, only to get another drop on my arm. I let out a screech of pain as the skin there began blistering immediately. I could hardly think, and not just because of the burning and the terror. The fumes were building as the pool widened, and I could feel my lungs tightening as I sucked in the chemicals with each gasping breath. Please! Don't do this, please! There was no answer, and the stream from the hose grew stronger. It would reach us within a couple of minutes. The girl was squealing again behind me, but for the moment my attention was at new motion at the top of the hole. A small metal ladder of steel cords and bar rungs had been rolled over the edge next to the hose. As I watched in dismay, the hose was lifted and sat atop the ladder, the acid splashing the rungs as it poured out into the pit. Turning back to the girl, I heard the engine start again and drive away. There was no one coming to help us. We were going to die down here, horribly and painfully, with the only way out just another version of that same burning death. I looked down at the green note again and swallowed. There is only one parachute. Beating her eyes, I began to cry myself. I reached forward slowly to retrieve the gas mask from where it lay in the poncho's hood, feeling my throat burn as I whispered to her. I'm so sorry. I'd like to say I was gentle as I took off the poncho, but I was scared and there was no time and she had figured out enough to try and resist. I didn't mean to hurt her, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't know I was grabbing her broken arm too hard when she started to squirm. The pool was to us by the time I'd buttoned up the poncho. Running around the edge, I made sure to look down before reaching the hungry stream coming from the hose. I half expected the poncho not to matter. A last cruel trick from whoever was behind all of this. But no, it seemed to be holding, and while I could hear the bottom of my shoes popping and feel needle-sharp pricks of pain as acid splashed onto the uncovered part of my legs, the poncho seemed to resist it well enough. My body protested as I gripped the first rung through the skin of my covering, but my desperate fear and adrenaline were louder. I made it to the top quickly, stripping off the poncho and mask as I looked around, followed by my shoes and jeans as they continued to burn. There was no one else up there, and when I looked back down in the pit, the girl had stopped moving. Maybe the fumes had finally gotten to her. Maybe she wouldn't wake up again at the end. It was dark by the time I made it back to the park slot and used the emergency call phone. Twenty minutes later, I was in an ambulance, and two hours after that... A bemused detective was asking me questions as I fought off the haze of pain meds as best I could. I told him what I knew, which was little. They seemed skeptical, but they couldn't deny my injuries, and they promised to check everything out. That was two months ago. When I call, they say they canvassed the woods, but given the acreage and the vagueness of my directions, they haven't had any luck finding any tiger pits. Filled with acid. Then yesterday... Another detective assigned to the case called me, and I got her to admit they had found over two dozen filled-in holes in the general vicinity. No signs of bodies or acid, just deep holes that had been recently filled in. It was then that she asked the question I'd been dreading since I ran away from the tiger pit into the dark. Why didn't you stop the acid? Why didn't you stop the acid? What? Well, you said you saw no one when you got to the top, right? Yeah. And you claim there was a trailer up there with a giant plastic tank on it? This was what held the acid that was running through the hose into the hole, right? Um, yeah, right. So why didn't you stop the acid once you were up top? Might could have still saved that girl. You said it was just barely to her at that point. I... 
there was no shut-off valve. I... I, um... I looked, and there was no shut-off valve. A pause. And then, okay, but why not just move the hose? Even if you couldn't stop the acid, you could have kept it from pouring down on that poor girl, right? I swallowed. Um, I guess... I was in shock, okay? I was in a lot of pain. Her voice was harder now. No doubt. I saw pictures from you at the hospital. You were messed up. But not so messed up you couldn't travel miles to a phone in the dark. Not so messed up that you couldn't move a hose a couple of feet. If what you're telling us is the truth, I was crying now. I, it is the truth, all of it. But I was scared, all right. What if they were still watching? They'd said one parachute. Only one of us could leave. What if I made them mad and they came back? Came back for me. I could hear the disgust in her voice. I see. Well, my partner doesn't believe you too much, if I'm being honest. The land is actually state land, technically. Someone died without any kin some years ago, and no one has tried to buy it since. And no real reason to think some nut has been sneaking out there and booby-trapping the place, either. We've had dogs and rangers out there with us twice, but aside from the loose dirt in spots, which the corpse dogs have checked without hitting, by the way, there's nothing to support your story other than your word and a few chemical burns. Trembling, I wasn't sure what to say. Still, I like to think I have a good instinct. Better than his, anyway. And I think I believe you, though it'd be better for both of us if it wasn't true. What do you mean? <laughs> well, just think about it. What are the odds that you would be in some isolated wood where some deranged killer was tormenting that poor girl, based on what you described, and assuming for the moment that the holes we found were related, it sounds like this killer had released this girl bound and unable to speak in this mask and poncho get up to what? Run around in the woods for a while. Why? And what was stopping her from just running off like you did? I pushed out a shaky breath. I don't know. Maybe the collar. Maybe it shocked her if she left a certain range. Kept her in an area until she fell into a pit. Oh, maybe. But then the pit wasn't just meant for her, was it? What? Well, you said there was a note on her. Only one can leave or something, right? There's only one parachute. Right. Yeah, right. So that message was intended for someone that found the girl and opened the poncho, right? I guess. But how would they know there'd be another person? I felt myself growing irritated, my shame and anger and fear all welling back up like they'd been in the days after I'd escaped the trap. How the F should I know? Well, and I'm just thinking out loud here, but what if it wasn't random luck that you were the one that fell into that pit? What do you mean? What if this wasn't about the girl in the poncho? It was all about you. Maybe they'd been following you, watching you, studying your habits, planning a way of getting you where they wanted... That doesn't make any sense. Why would they do that? Why would they tie up a girl, slap a gas mask and poncho on her, and then toss her down into a pit only to then fill it with acid? Or do you still think she jumped in herself? I... no. I think someone shoved her in probably. Well, if we're going to believe all of that from you, why do we need to assume they have any rational reason for any of this at all? Maybe they're just some psycho-sadist that wants to hurt people. I could feel myself growing clammy with sweat as I looked out the window at the street below. Um, yeah, maybe. I was going to try and end the call, but she was talking again. And so maybe this saddest is really after you. Maybe they've been slowly influencing your life in small ways for months, waiting to see if you'd notice. If you'd see the dark thread that had entered the fabric of your life. If you'd finally see them. Detective, I need to be going. Thank you for the up. And maybe the collar wasn't a fence. It was a bit in the mouth, steering a little pony this way and that when needed. Or maybe, just maybe, it wasn't even the girl under the poncho that was chasing you the entire time. Maybe it was the monster that put you down in that pit and helped you burn that poor girl up while she tried to scream. I... this is... I'm sorry. But what did you say your name was again? I'm going to have to speak to your supervisor. I said my name was Brown. Or Browning. Or Blake! I don't remember! Who are you? It doesn't really matter who I am, does it? You're asking the wrong question. I, 
What's the right question? Where am I? I, you crazy F, I'm calling the cops. If you do, they won't find you when they get here. What? You won't find you when they get here? What? She gave a light laugh. Nothing much. Just to answer one more question. I, okay, what? Do you see me now? Thanks for listening, Our Stories. If you'd like to support us, do hit that like button, subscribe, and hit a notification bell. Thank you, ghouls.